Amen. All right. Thank you. Um, we're, of course, continuing our series on the parables of Jesus. And this week we come to the parable of the Lord's wedding banquet, which is kind of appropriate for our family and what's going on this weekend on Saturday. And if I had something to write on the board, I guess I would write, y'all come. Right, Pat? <laughs> y'all come? Y'all come. Okay. So, but we've had several weddings in our class. Uh, Joe, I, you did a great job, looks like. Hitching your boy and Ying, yeah. So we had several weddings already that have happened, uh, but just re most recently there. And uh, we got more coming up, right? <laughs> so we just witnessed, though, an epic royal wedding, didn't we? How many of y'all got up Saturday morning and actually spent time watching that? Some of you were out working, doing stuff, but others of you, I'm sure, got up and... Yeah, okay, all right. Some of you watched uh, Prince Harry and uh, Meghan Markle, now the Duke and the Duchess of Saxony, right? Uh, with all the British pomp and circumstance and a few Hollywood actors thrown in for good measure. Uh, but there was not one, but there were actually two receptions. Did you know that? There were two receptions following this epic royal wedding. The first one, of course, happened directly after the ceremony at St. George's Hall. There were 600 invited, most of whom were already there for the ceremony and the celebration. But the second one was in the evening, and that one was far more exclusive. There were only 200 invited, and the host was Prince Charles himself, and it was held at Frogmore House. Now, do you wonder why they called it Frogmore, Ernie? Frog More frogs. They had plenty of frogs in the ponds around that house. And so if you wanted to go frog digging, that was a place to go. But no, actually it wasn't. But there was a lot of great stuff on the menu, though, I'm sure. But only 200 invited to that exclusive gathering hosted by Prince Charles. Well, Jesus compares here the rule of God, wedding, reception, a banquet, a feast. Let's look at it in verses 1 to 14. David, would you kick us off and read the first Jesus verse? Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, he said. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Mm -hmm. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bid to the wedding, and they would not come. Mm. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army to destroy those murderers and burn their city. Mm. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads, and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads, and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed the man <coughs> there was not wearing wedding clothes. Mm. All right, so there's the parable about the wedding feast. You know, uh, there are other exclusive invitations that have gone out. I mean, here in America, we've had, we've had many. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, when uh, I was in college in 1985, uh, there was an exclusive invitation to which few were invited, but many wanted to come. President Ronald Reagan, his wife Nancy, had invited Prince Charles, we already mentioned him, and Lady Diana, who was alive at that time, uh, to a banquet, a gala ball, there in Washington, D.C., at the White House. And this uh, banquet for royalty was to be both extravagant and elegant, and only 80 people got invitations to that one. Don't you think that was probably the hottest ticket in Washington, D.C.? I mean, there, the, 
There were, you know, all of Washington society wanted to come. Senators called in favors, but to no avail. Uh, there were, you know, wealthy dignitaries are offered to pay handsomely, but only 80 were invited. Few were invited, but many wanted to come. Well, Jesus tells a story here that is the exact opposite. I mean, this is the royal wedding feast. Many were invited, but few wanted to come, at least initially, right? It's interesting. Matthew 22 here, he's speaking parabolically and compared the king's invitation to a wedding banquet to his invitation to the kingdom of heaven to allow God to reign and to rule in our lives as king. And so this invitation really is the good news, isn't it? It's the gospel about Jesus whose kingdom was inaugurated at his first coming. It'll be consummated at his second coming when he's proclaimed as king of kings and Lord of Lords, and we read in Revelation 19 about the great wedding supper of the Lamb. So this is a preview, really, of that. Um, and yet in this story, many refused the invitation, and that must have stunned Jesus' hearers, for this was not only an invitation to a feast, but it was a royal feast. And it wasn't just a royal feast, it was a royal wedding feast. And in Jesus' day, that's when the king would announce his son as heir to the throne. I mean, this was an opportunity of a lifetime for these people. And those people in Jesus' day understood that. And so to come was to show loyalty to the king. To not come and to refuse the invitation was to show not only disrespect, but disloyalty. So it was unthinkable, unfathomable, that anyone would refuse this invitation from the king. You probably heard our pastor tell us uh, that they lasted for seven days. They began with a grand breakfast, and on the seventh day, the ultimate day, the final day, they threw a great triumphant banquet. And being invited to the wedding banquet of the king's son, that was the pinnacle experience of a lifetime. I mean, there was nothing else really that you could match with that. Indeed, a wedding banquet would be a joyous feast and not a sad fast. And I make that point because I want us to understand that Jesus is comparing the kingdom of heaven, the Christian life, to a celebration, a banquet, a feast. Everything about a royal feast, the exhilaration of being in the presence of the king, the excitement of sitting among glittering guests, the anticipation of the aroma from that sumptuous table, everything that happens here at a banquet is a picture and a parable of what happens when Jesus comes to reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in your heart and life. That's what the Christian life ought to be. It ought to be a celebration. It ought to be joyous, sad, fast. <laughs> and when he comes to rule and to reign, that's what it is, really. That's what it is. It's a feast, not a fast. But you know what, if that's true, then most of us, can we admit it, are poor advertisements <laughs> to what Jesus said that this Christian life, that the rule of God is, is all about. For the gospel is something that ought to be celebrated. It ought to be joyous. It ought to be a feast, right? The problem is, most of us don't think of the Christian life as a celebration, a banquet as a feast. We act as though the Christian life is something to be endured rather than to be enjoyed. And if our experience of the Christian life is the dull and the tedious and the slavish and the our experience of the Christian life, then we have not experienced what Jesus is talking about here in this parable. Right? I mean, really. Um, Jesus welcomes us to a feast and not a fast. The psalmist says what? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's right. Psalm 34, verse 8. And so this parable, as you look at it, it's an allegory. And, and several of the parables are. That is, there's an equivalent here. There's a one-for-one -one equivalent. That this stands for that. This stands for that. This stands for that. And as you look at it, obviously the king is God. Right? The king is God. The king's son, the prince royal, is the Lord Jesus Christ. The feast, the banquet, is both present and its future. 
Um, the banquet is feasting on the riches of His grace now, here in this life. But then there's the ultimate experience of that wedding banquet in Revelation chapter 19 when we're robed with that righteousness and we're sitting around the table of the king in the kingdom, right? That's the ultimate wedding banquet that's going to happen. But it's here and it's now. The invitation, what's the invitation? It's the gospel. It's the invitation that has gone out from the opening pages of Genesis to this very day. And thank God, whosoever will may come. Now, we looked at the Calvinist parable a couple of weeks ago where God's sovereignty is at the forefront, right? He's choosing the workers. He's choosing the time. He's choosing the pay, right? And there is that element of that. And the Calvinists love that parable. They think that's theirs. Well, look at this one. <laughs> Y'all come is the message, right? There's no picking and choosing. He says even there, the good and the bad, I want everybody to come, though not everyone will. I want everybody to come and fill my banquet hall. Whosoever will may come. Great invitation, isn't it? And, you know, the sad thing is, though, what happens? Not everybody responds to that invitation, do they? Some reject it. Ironically, few wanted to come. It was almost unheard of. I mean, if you got an invitation from Prince Charles to come to Frogmore Mansion and they paid your expenses, they put you on a private plane, a jet, to fly over there, and he gave you that invitation, would you go? Ernie says, no, unless they let me frog gig. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, most everybody would say, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go if they pay my way and I got a chance to participate. But you know what? This is far better here than what Jesus is talking about, right? Far better than that. This is the eternal celebration of the Son. And while God gives a gracious invitation to come to His Son's wedding celebration and provides the proper attire for it, as we'll see, He also examines those who do come to make sure that they have the garment that He alone can provide. Well, let's look at it. First of all, notice the king extends his invitation graciously. There are no less than three invitations in this story. There's an initial invitation, a follow-up invitation, and an ultimate invitation, all given by a gracious king. Notice that the king extends his invitation initially there in verse 3. In Jesus' world, there were two invitations given to a banquet like this. Um, the initial invitation came days before. And if you accepted that first invitation that was usually in writing, uh, it was a pledge, it was a vow, it was an oath that you would come. Eastern hospitality demanded it. And if you didn't follow through on it, it was a big deal <laughs> for you to reject the invitation of a king. That first invitation had already gone out. In fact, we read in the text that this invitation we read about in verse 3 is actually which one? It's the second invitation. Do you notice that? Look at the wording. What does it say there? It says that the king sent his servants to call those who were invited. So they've already gotten the invitation once. This is the second invitation to the wedding feast. Here the king calls those who had already been called. And that was the, you know, they, they didn't have any, you know, Apple watches, <laughs> they didn't have any phones to check their, uh, that's how I, I know what time it is, I don't wear a watch anymore. Uh, they didn't have any watches, they didn't have any time pieces, they had, you know, maybe a sundial, but they didn't usually know what time it was, so they had to have somebody go out into the streets, a crier, to announce that, hey, the dinner is ready, it's prepared, come to the banquet, right? And that was the usual practice. Uh, they, they went out and said, hey, the table, you know, the banquet's ready, the table's set, food's hot, and they sent the crier to announce, come to the feast. And Jesus picks up the story here with his second invitation. The king was inviting the invited. Now, what's he talking about? Well, there's an application here, and that is God graciously has extended his invitation to come to the banquet again and again and again. 
hasn't he? I mean, the first application, of course, were to the people was to the people right in front of Jesus at this very moment. He's talking to the Jewish people, and he's extending this invitation. And if you took the 39 books of the Old Testament and you distilled them down to the essence, you could say that this parable is a cameo. It's a picture of everything that had happened from the very time that God called that meandering Mesopotamian named Abraham out of Ur, out of the Chaldees, and said to him that I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. In fact, many nations, right? From that very time, he was saying what? Come to the feast. From the time that he called Ab uh, Moses out of the midst of that burning bush and said, I want you to deliver, deliver my people out of slavery in Egypt and bring them to the promised land, a land that flows with milk and honey. What was he saying? He was saying, come to the feast from the time that he talked to that shepherd boy who would become king. And he wrote in the Psalm 23 that he has set before me a table, a table before my enemies and my cup overflows. I mean, he's saying again and again, come to the feast. If you think, think of the whole scriptures are crying out the invitation in the Old Testament. He tells us through the tabernacle. He lays it out in the law. He sings it in the Psalms and he pleads it through the prophets. The whole Old Testament is calling, come to the feast. You know, it's kind of like the teaser for the 11 o'clock news. You know, usually they break in about 8 o'clock and they say details at 11. At 9 o'clock they come back, details at 11. At, at 10 o'clock they come back, details at 11, right? I mean, it, details when the king sends his son and after nearly 400 years of silence God sent John the Baptist to announce behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and Jesus came preaching and teaching and healing with a message that the kingdom of God is at hand repent and believe in the good news that was the second invitation the initial invitation from the Old Testament the second immediate invitation from John the Baptist and from Jesus, the feast is here, come now, right? God has graciously extended his invitation initially and repeatedly. But that's not only true historically, that's true for us personally. If each one of us were to bear witness of the many ways that God has called us to that invitation, and issued that invitation to come to the banquet, to come to the feast, to come to my son. He's issued it in many ways. It really, this parable really represents our spiritual biography, if you think about it. I mean, God's been calling you from the beginning. Come to my feast. I mean, think about it. I mean, how's he called? The book of Romans tells us that he's called three ways. Through creation, through conscience, and through his commandments. And as a result of that, Paul says... Chapter 2, we're all without excuse. We've, I, I, it doesn't matter if you're a pagan on some remote island and you've never heard the gospel. Creation and conscience still have revealed something of the Creator God to you. Right? I mean, think about the creation. I mean, think about that for a second. Uh, you know, the creation itself is the visible creation proclaims the invisible God. The heavens and the earth declare, what does it say, Psalm 8? The glory of God, right? The sun and the moon and the stars are celestial evangelists. The wind whispers it. The thunder booms it. And the waves repeat it. The, the visible creation proclaims the invisible God and forms a chorus calling, come to the feast. If you never hear the name Jesus, we're still going to be held accountable for the revelation that God has given through the creation. That's Romans 1, if you want the reference. Okay, read the chapter, you'll get the point. I don't have time to go through all that because our time is limited. I don't have a clock. I do have my phone. All right, we're good. <laughs> but then also through conscience, through conscience. That indelible image 
that marks every human being as a free moral agent. He's given us the ability from the garden to choose, right? He said you can eat from, you can choose fruit from any tree in this garden except one, right? You are free to choose. That's it, actually Bible language. You're free to choose. And our conscience is a law unto itself, even without the law, Paul says. I mean, God has put enough of his image in us so that we know instinctively right from wrong. Now, of course, that gets marred, it gets warped, it gets twisted. It's not perfect, but it's still there as a witness to us. The conscience is, right? And so then he also calls, thirdly, and this is chapter 2 in Romans, through the commandments, through the law of God through his revealed will, right? And his word animated and alive by his Holy Spirit convicts of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and points us to Jesus. And you think about it. Add to that the people in our lives who populate our lives, our roommates, you know, our, our, our classmates, our husbands, our wives, the preachers, the Sunday school teachers, the worship leaders, the choirs, the Bibles, the churches, the steeples, the crosses, everything around us calls come to the feast come to the feast God invites us initially and repeatedly that happened in this parable the invitation was extended initially and even a second time but notice the response in verse 3 for Jesus hearers it was a jaw dropper what they won't come this is amazing astonishing They wouldn't come. This would have been a a shock to his hearers. No one would have turned down an invitation to a royal wedding feast. It was an invitation of a lifetime. In the Arab world, such a rejection was seditious, treasonous, and tantamount to a declaration of war. And we'll get to that in just a second. But that leads me to the second point there, and that is he, he extends his invitation persistently. Now, an ordinary king would have stopped here, okay? Two invitations, that, that's enough. If you don't come, that's on you, not on me. But not this king. This king is better. <laughs> this king is more merciful. This king is more gracious than the normal king, okay? Because we're talking about God. And that's how God is. God is so good. And God is so gracious that he goes the extra mile. He gives the extra invitation. A third, unprecedented, unheard of invitation goes out. This surprising king of grace and mercy who gives repeated calls to come. Verse 4, look at it. He sent forth other servants. Alos means others of the same kind. This third invitation is unparalleled in literature. You just don't find it. And these servants call attention to the urgency and the excellency of the feast. Through these servants, the king, first of all, renews his call, stressing the urgency of it. The, the Greek here is uh, edu, behold. I don't know what your version is, see. Um, hey, y'all, look. <laughs> That's what he's saying in the Greek here. I've prepared my dinner. Everything's ready, verse 4. But not only the urgency of it, but he calls attention to the excellency of it. What's he serving on the menu? Tells us here in verse 4. I mean, this is stall, fed, grain, fed, beef. This is veal. This is the good stuff, right? That's the fatted calf that we're talking about right here. The king has prepared such a feast as only a king could prepare. And so there's an urgent call to an unbelievable feast. Every table laden with food, every goblet filled with drink, every candle flickering with light and the king is gracious and he's patient and he gives yet a third invitation it's ready it's ready it's going to be wonderful come come no earthly king would ever be that good but god is isn't he god is better than the best of people no earthly king would be like this. So Jesus hears must have been shocked to hear that part of the parable as well. (laughs) An unheard of third invitation. The king extends his invitation persistently. It's urgent. It's excellent. 
come. And again, the application here is obvious. I mean, historically, God invited the Jews to his kingdom through the law and the prophets and the Psalms, all the 90, all those 39 books told of the coming of the kingdom and his kingdom. And that was the initial, the advance invitation. The second invitation, of course, came, as we said, with John the Baptist announcing a baptism of repentance, pointing to Jesus, Jesus coming and preaching that the kingdom of heaven is here. It's now. I'm it. God is reigning and ruling through me. Come to me, Jesus says. But then the third invitation went out. After his crucifixion, his apostles, filled with the Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost, issued the third invitation to the Jewish people. And then the apostle Paul and the disciples go to the ends of the earth with it. Right? So a third invitation goes out. They enlarged it, they pressed it persistently, come to the feast. But many rejected that invitation. They refused to come still. Personally, think about it. I mean, the way God has called you, not only through, you know, initially and immediately and persistently, not only through the Bible preaching and the Bible teaching and all those witnesses, during various parts of your life, like we talked about in that parable, the day laborer, some, for, some he calls early in the day, you know, at the beginning of life, but we think, oh, well, you know, I've got life ahead of me. I don't have time for that now. Or maybe as a young adult and you've got the, 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 the task of raising a family and getting started in your job and you're too busy to come now. Or maybe in the middle of life, where you've got your burden down and you're concerned about retirement and you're saying, I just still can't come now. And yet he calls and he calls and he calls. And many who come to Christ later in life say, man, I wish, I wish, I wish I'd come earlier. And God only calls from the Bible preaching and the teaching, but through the positive and negative experiences in life, whether it's at you know, the reminder that comes when you're standing at the marriage altar or when the baby is born and you're holding that baby in your arms or at the negative times of life when there's a death and there's a gash in the ground that we call a grave that we stand beside and God reminds us, he, he calls us, he's persistent in his call to come to the banquet. Now notice though that many say no. The king's invitation is rejected seditiously. Remember I told you, this was tantamount to treason to say no to the king's royal wedding feast because at that feast, what would happen? The son was proclaimed as heir. So that was to come to the feast was an act of loyalty. Not to come to the feast was an act of disloyalty to the king. And notice here that this third invitation is refused with indifference, and some with violence. First of all, indifference. Notice, some just too busy, right? What does it say here in verse 5 and 6? They made light of it. They were too busy. One with his farm, the Greek word is agron, from which we get the word agriculture, right? Uh, another with his, what? Business, the Greek word is emporion, from which we get the word emporium. That makes sense to you, doesn't it? I mean, these Greek words, a lot of times, they go right with your English. <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of interesting, though, to look at Luke's version of this parable. If you look over at chapter 14 in Luke, and you read the excuses. Remember the excuses in Luke? It's Luke's version. Chapter 14, verses 18 to 20. There are three groups of people, right? There are three individuals. The invitation goes out. And you remember that one says, verse 18, he says, I just bought a piece of land, and i got to go see it. What a lame excuse is that? And another says, I just bought a team of oxen and I must try them out. Verse 19. And then the third one says, I just got married and I can't come. Maybe she was a mail order bride and hadn't even seen her yet. I don't know. <laughs> but these excuses point out the fact that those who reject the invitation aren't too smart. Kind of dumb. Right? I mean not to look at land before you buy it, not to try a team of oxen before you buy them. I won't even comment on the wife for fear of getting in trouble, but you get the point. These people are pretty stupid. 
to say no to the invitation of the king. Some refused because they simply had other things to do. They thought that were more important. And in the context of Jesus' day and the story that he tells, it was unthinkable. It was unthinkable not to accept this invitation, to pass up this opportunity of a lifetime. If we really understood how great a feast the Christian life really is, it would be unthinkable to pass up the opportunity that Jesus offers every individual when he says, come to me. <laughs> unthinkable. And yet, some reject the invitation through indifference. They don't see the value. They simply make light of it. They go on their way and they're busy with other pursuits. But others reject it, not with indifference, but with violence. What do they do to the servants of the king? It says some arrogantly, they spitefully. Um, hubri is the word, hubris, we get from that. Uh, arrogantly killed the servants. This is an open act of sedition, of treason, and essentially a declaration of war. And so the question comes, is there a limit to the patience of this good and gracious king? And the answer is yes. Yes, there is. Now some say, and there's a big debate in Christianity about this. In fact, the churches that really helped us get started with a revolution in New England have sold out to this. They're now called Unitarian Universalist churches. In fact, in our study of the Founding Fathers, as I went through each one and looked at the pastors of those churches where those founders sat and listened to the Bible preached week after week after week in the faithful exposition of God's Word that inspired them to go and make the sacrifices that they made to sign that document and put their lives on the line, I doubt those churches would inspire such sacrifice today because they believe that at the end of the day, God's going to wink and God's going to nod and God's going to invite all to come on in anyway, whether you believe in Jesus or not. Universalism. Well, this doesn't teach that. Now, does it? <laughs> not at all. This book does not teach that. I don't know what book they're getting it out of, but it ain't this book. Um, we see here there is an end to his patience. Verse 7, this gracious king was enraged, it says. King James is what? I love the King James here. Come on, tell me what it is. Wrath. Wrath. It just sounds madder. I know that's not a word. It sounds madder, doesn't it? than just angry, right, or, or enraged. The, king, the, the Greek word is orge. It, it's different from thumos, from which we get the word thermos. That's a flash fire anger that's temporary. But orge is something that burns like coals and it stays hot, smoldering. This is the word that is used here. It's like that, the, the, the volcano that is erupting on the big island in Hawaii and that lava comes out hot and it stays that way and it destroys everything in its path. You've been seeing it, right? Kind of scary. Well, the word that is used here is orge. <laughs> it's the settled disposition of a holy God whose son has been rejected. But there's a line from C.S. Lewis that I want you to hear that just grabbed me when I read it. He said that, the, that anger is the fluid that bleeds, that love bleeds when you cut it. Anger is the fluid that love bleeds when you cut it. When you say no to the king, you cut his love and what comes out is what? Anger, the wrath, the wrath of God. But now look, this is after the first invitation. And they said no. And the second invitation, and they said no. The unprecedented third invitation and they said, no, means wrath. That's the way it worked out in history. The initial invitation in the Old Testament, the immediate invitation from John the Baptist and Jesus, the third invitation from the apostles. 
how did the Jews react mostly to the gospel? The day of Pentecost was great, but not all came. Most refused the gospel. They crucified Jesus. They persecuted the apostles and put them to death. Most refused. And the king displayed his wrath. 70 A.D., Titus and the Roman legions came, pulled down the walls, demolished the temple, slaughtered the citizens in Jerusalem. And Israel ceased to exist. And the people were scattered. The wrath of the king. Because they said no. And if that's true historically, do you have a doubt in your mind that that's not going to happen to those who say a resolute no to the king and his son? That's sad, isn't it? It's sad, but it's true. He calls graciously. He calls urgently. He calls persistency, persistently. But there's an end to it, isn't there? The king who displayed grace also displayed wrath. He said, well, what in the world kind of king is this who can wage a wedding and a war at the same time? That's what he did. He, he committed his troops to battle, and they took these people out. He's waging a wedding and a war at the same time. What kind of king can do that? A great king. And when he comes back, when Jesus comes back in power and great glory, there will be a wedding and there will be a war. Revelation chapter 19. There will be a wedding banquet and there will be a war. He'll be on a white horse and there will be a sword out of his mouth and it will take out the enemy. What kind of king? A great king. Right? And how foolish to say no to his invitation. Well, the king enlarges his invitation generously. Look at it. The parable goes further. I mean, the king wasn't, his mercy wasn't exhausted, was it? He enlarged the invitation. Look at verses 8 and 9. Can you imagine? People from the farms and the villages and the streets all were invited. Y'all come. Y'all come. <laughs> One of the greatest, most generous invitations given in American history was an invitation to a presidential inauguration of Andrew Jackson from Tennessee on March the 4th. 1829. Of course, he was the hero of the War of 1812. He was a man of the people. He had moved out to the frontier of Tennessee. And, uh, you know, he was, a, he was very popular. He won the election mostly on the votes of the Western frontiersmen. And so, as a populist president, he invited all his friends and supporters who helped him get elected to come to Washington, come to the White House for inaugural, an inaugural banquet, a feast. Y'all come, he said. Well, they did. <laughs> they, came in, they came in buckskin. The uh, trappers, the traders, the farmers, the factory workers, they came to the shock of the Washington society. <laughs> they said it was like the second coming of the barbarians coming in to take over Rome. They invited him to come and they came. They came in through the doors and when they couldn't get in through the doors, they broke in the windows and climbed in. They came. <laughs> they ripped, tripped up the waiters. They broke the White House china and glassware. They overturned cabinets and tables. They spilled whiskey and when they couldn't find a spittoon, they just spit tobacco on the floor. <laughs> and they stood on the good chairs in their muddy boots just to get a glimpse of old Hickory Andrew Jackson back there and the only way that they could get him out the only way they could get him out was to take the tubs of punch spiked with whiskey outside the White House onto the lawn which lured this horde outside so that they could lock the doors. And Andrew Jackson 
literally had to escape and they ferried him off and he had to spend the night, his inaugural night, in a hotel, couldn't even stay in the White House. They had trashed it. <laughs> well, that's a funny story, but you know, in a way, that's a picture of what Jesus means when he says, invite them all to come in. All. He enlarges the scope of his invitation. Notice that the king wants a full house, verses 8 and 9. He sends them to the street corners, the terminal ends of the roads to bring people from far and near. He extends his invitation where the maximum number of people may hear and respond to it. And he enlarges the recipients of it. Verse 10, look at the kind of people he's, in, he's inviting. He wants everybody. What's the characterization here? Good and bad, the obviously good and the outwardly bad. He wants everyone to come. He wants his place full. Place they is the, is the Greek word. Filled to overflowing is what it means. The unlovely, the uncultured, the unprincipled, the immoral, the white, the black, the brown, the poor, the rich, the able-bodied, the handicapped, observably good or hourly bad. I don't care. I want them all to come in, he says. No one excluded, save their own refusal to come. Can you imagine these people limping, some groping, others blind, poor, clinging to a subsistence lifestyle, being invited into the great banquet hall of the king, you know, with eyes filled with wonder, palms that were sweating, jaws dropped open as they walked into the banquet hall, can you believe this gracious king who would invite the likes of us, of me? True historically, the religious leaders that Jesus is talking to, chapter 21, verse 45, right before this chapter, they knew he was talking about them in these parables. But they were afraid to do anything at that moment because the people held him up as a prophet. But these religious leaders had what? They had rejected the invitation with spiritual pride and with prejudice, with smugness and superiority. And so Jesus invited the publicans and the prostitutes to come, and they were coming. And then the apostles went throughout the ancient Roman Empire. And what did they do? They invited the pagans to come. And great numbers believed the gospel and came to the banquet because the king wants a full house for the celebration of his son. And that's the message that we need to carry to everybody, everywhere, no matter who they are. I mean, most of the time when you look at a church, it's the same kind of people. We're all a, kind of a lot alike. You know? white, mostly middle class folk. But that's not the intention of the invitation is to have people just like me. The intention of the invitation is to have people like me and not like me. <laughs> right? We need to break down the walls of spiritual pride and prejudice of smugness and superiority in our own lives or we'll never win anybody to Jesus other than our kids and grandkids and we're not going to do a good job winning them. In fact, statistics show that our is on its way down. Baptism's every year down. Ever since I was vice president of convention relations with the Southern Baptist Convention, the year I was there, it went down. And it's gone down every year year since 2006 till now every year since without a break constant decline down now it's great that we preach the book we're true to the book but we also need to be laser focused on the mission which is to extend the invitation indiscriminately to everybody everywhere regardless of their color, regardless of their walk of life, regardless of their circumstances, everybody, everywhere gets an invitation. Listen, if, if we don't accept the king's invitation, others will. That's what he's saying here. 
The grace of God will not be thwarted. It will not be defeated. He will gather a great people, whether you and I come or not. His hall will be full. The gospel will go out. God will find a way that his feast is full. And in our modern age, it happened historically with the Jews, as we've already mentioned. But in our modern age, when the old world was weird with the gospel, what happened? It moved to the new world with our settlers and our pioneers and our people here in America so that America could be the launch point for missions and missions activity to go throughout the world. But now we're getting gospel weary here in America. And the number of people who say no religion, thank you, keeps growing and growing and growing. And yet the gospel will not be defeated because it is exploding in Asia and Africa and in South America. The invitation is going out and people are coming in. But that's not just a commentary on what's happening in the world. It should be a challenge to us here in this church. Because if things don't change over the next 10 or 15 or 20 years, you're going to see a building that is mostly empty, but he wants it full. We need to get serious about extending the invitation. Finally, and I've got to go quickly, and that is the king examines one of the invited glaringly. I mean, he shows up to the feast, he looks at the spectacle, but he sees one guy stands out like a sore thumb. Why? He's not got the right clothes on. Now in the ancient Near East, if you came, and they were some people hastily invited, in the ancient Near East, you came to the feast, you were provided with a wedding garment. What the law of the king required, the grace of the king provided. And yet here's this guy. And the reason for his examination is obvious. He didn't come looking for somebody unprepared. He couldn't help but see the guy. He's there, you know. <laughs> and he's offered the wedding garment. He disobediently refused it. And he's sitting there like a sore thumb, sitting in a feast who had refused the covering of the king. And the king confronts him. Dude. Why aren't you wearing a wedding garment? I guess he thought he was just going to hide or sneak by or hide behind somebody so that the king couldn't see him. I don't know. Have you ever done that in a crowd? You kind of move around so people can't see you. Ever done that? Uh, I don't know. This guy maybe tried to duck around, but he got seen, right? He's confronted, and he had nothing to say. He's, he's speechless. I mean, what could he say? I mean, the king had provided the garment, and he didn't have it on. And then the result of the examination was... Verse 13, not good. What's it a picture of? Hell, outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Stands as a frightening warning. Hell is real. But it can be avoided, right? God has made a way. Certainly, God provides the covering of righteousness, which we need to attend His final feast. And it won't be because of our goodness. It won't be because of our faithfulness. It won't be because of our service. Because our righteousness is like what? Filthy rags. They'll be rejected. The only way I'll get in the feast, the only way you'll get in the feast, the only way anybody will get in the feast is by the robe of righteousness provided by the king. It's an imputed righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin that we might be what? The righteousness of God in him. Philippians 3.9 Paul says the only way we can get in is to be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes how? Through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith. What the law of the king requires, the grace of the king provides. We sing it. Clothed with his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne.
You want to reserve a seat at the royal wedding feast of the ages? The garment he requires, he gives. And certainly just days after he told this parable, what did he do? He carried a cross up Calvary. They put a crown of thorns on his brow. Hammered spikes into his wrists and his ankles. Thrust a spear into his side. And he dropped as he died the garment that we might be able to pick it up and wrap it around ourselves and be able to come to the feast with the garment provided by a gracious king. And now what's our job? Criers. Going to the street corners with a great invitation. Not to a sad feast, but to a celebration. A banquet. A feast. It's like nothing in this world. Let's share it, right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in your grace you have invited each of us initially, repeatedly, ultimately to come to the banquet celebrating your son. God, most, if not all, here this morning have responded to that invitation. We've traded our rags for your rich royal robe of righteousness. Thank you, God, that what your law requires, your grace provides at the great cost of your darling son. Thank you for his sacrifice that makes that possible. We can come in no other way to your banquet. But God, help us to be flaming and fiery evangelists and good news tellers to everyone everywhere, regardless of their walk of life, their skin color, their circumstances. There's a great invitation that needs to go out because you want your house full for that wedding banquet honoring your son. God, help us to honor and obey you with that joyous word that we need to share. Faithfully sharing it. God, even this week as Vacation Bible School is going on, we just ask that the sharing of that wonderful message would be effective and that many kids would come to know Jesus as Savior and as King and as Lord. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.